There is blind justice, and then there is trading justice, so that you can finally afford to get that laser eye surgery. Not only will people find you more attractive once you ditch those old glasses, you'll be able to see your charts better. That's what we call win-win. Speaking of winning, it's time for a little trading justice. Brought to you by TackleTrading.com. Okay, welcome out to the Trading Justice podcast here again. And we've got a special guest today. It's Matt and Tim with Solon. Solon is here to talk about the Greek situation that we're dealing with over in Europe. As traders and investors, there's a lot of stuff going on around the globe right now that impacts our markets, that impacts what's happening out there. Matt, how are you doing today? And uh, let's bring you in here. Let's check your mics. You know, Tim, I'm doing absolutely fantastic today. Um, just kind of been hanging out and watching the markets and Getting uh, getting up to speed on all the uh, nice little Fed speeches that we've had this week, not only here in the U.S. but Draghi speaking for the ECB the last couple of days, Yellen speaking for the uh, FOMC the last couple of days. What uh, have they said? What have they said? Because I knew they were speaking. I've I've watched the headlines, but I actually have not seen the testimony. What have they actually said that is of any substance? Um, if you know the Fed as well as I do, nothing. There's nothing they ever say. Okay. One thing do they ever say that has any meaning in any capacity? The Fed is a bunch of trained lawyers, and they're, they're, they're literally, whenever they say something of substance, they immediately start to backtrack. Immediately. They, they, yeah. I, I swear to God that every central banker in the world was trained by Alan Greenspan. I swear it. Well, you know, I asked this question in my class the other day. I said, do you think Janet Yellen got all fancied up, took uh, took a, a town car ride down to Capitol Hill, got in front of Congress, and then was going to actually answer those questions honestly? Uh, you know, it's like I, I don't know what we expect out of these testimonies in terms of actual information that we can use or that we're looking for. But, you know, they can be market movers. So anybody trading out there, you can use them as news based events. But, Here, here's, two uh, you. Here, here's two headlines for you. Jenny Yellen says yesterday, we do not believe in currency manipulation. That's really we really <laughs> What have they done for the last 20 years then? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you do not believe in currency manipulation. Right. What in the hell has all of this been about that? <laughs> I, I, I don't believe in gravity. I believe that with the proper mental training, I can teach myself to fly, Matt. So <laughs> I've seen heroes. I know how it gets down. I know how to uh, go. Yeah. You no, give me a little, you gotta, give me a little <laughs> magic pixie dust and I'm going to get going. This is awesome. Right. My God, they can go to hell. Seriously. I am so sick of it. And then e the ECB president, Draghi, comes out today. He's like, no, we're not pressuring Greece. <laughs> what? Right. What? Right. There's no, pre no pressure on Greece. No pressure on Greece. In, in other words, Greece, we will burn your villages down and send you off into the Mediterranean Ocean if you don't agree to these debt restructuring. But, you know, no pressure, guys. I mean, you got to do whatever you want to do. It's it's just it's an absolute joke between the Bank of Japan, the ECB, and the FOMC. I honestly don't know which clown is worse. I really don't. They're all a bunch of clowns. clowns. Yeah. Boom. Well, you know, the thing about trading, though, and investing and being a, a human being on this planet is you can't worry too much about what other people are doing. It does affect you directly if you allow it to. But if you step outside of it and you find a way to, to exist in your own little pocket, your own little vacuum, take advantage of those situations, that's probably the right mindset instead of, you know, just sitting back and waiting for some impact uh, that is going to happen anyway. You know, it's... There's a rule in the game, Tim, that you don't fight the Fed. Okay? Yeah. That, that's the rule in the game. Do not fight the Fed. The Fed, if you can learn how to speak Fed, Fed speak... Then, then you can really kind of understand what they're trying to do. What Janet Yellen tried to do yesterday and today was to deliver a soft landing for interest rate hikes. That's, that's what she, that was her entire intention over the mm -hmm. course. It was like, oh, wait, 
the economy is doing really, really good, then why are you raised the interest rates already? What, what's wrong with you? Oh, but we're still a little concerned about unemployment and inflation. Oh, yeah, but, you know, if, if the labor market picks up like it has, I mean, that's going to be amazing, you know, but uh, we're still a little concerned about this. So every time they say one thing, they immediately start saying the opposite thing just to confuse. And so what, the, what she tried to do yesterday was basically say something that, honestly, Tim, we've been saying for two years now, the Fed mm -hmm. is going to raise interest rates in the second or third quarter of Rule 15. Well, you know, my favorite example of what you're talking about, though, hold on a sec, I want to cut in for, for a quick second about how they use new terms to intentionally confuse. When the Federal Reserve started their program, they called it what, Matt? Credit easing. And credit, quanti credit easing, quantitative easing, right? And they even had the TARP program, the Toxic Asset Repurchasing Program. Um, and they called it TARP. They gave it a little synonym. What is the ECB starting next month? Do you know the name of it? Um, uh, did they name it something new? Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, in fact, now I got to, I want to look it up just to make sure. I think it's called the Asset Repurchasing Program. Oh, oh, the Asset Repurchasing Program. Or purchasing or something like that. Bonds? I mean, seriously, has, has too many people caught on to the word bond that mm -hmm. too many people now know what quantitative easing is? Has the Trading Justice podcast done their job mm -hmm. good enough that the ECB is no longer using the word quantitative easing? Because too That's many right. people know what I think people know what quantitative easing is, so they just couldn't call it that. And in fact, in the ECB's official documentation on their website, they're like, well, yeah, this is like quantitative easing from the states, but it's our asset purchasing program. And they're all a bunch of jokes. I'm telling you, Kuro and Abunomics and from Japan, and then you got the Draghi and the ECB, and they all say the same damn thing. They call it something else. They wrap their little stinky bacon wrap around it, and they just think it's going to just trick people. And you know what? They're right. <laughs> That's the sad part, Tim. They're right. They know that if they just change names enough, then nobody gives a shit any longer, and they check the F out. Right, I'm just, right, 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 right. I'm honestly just sick of it. I, I, I read about... I don't know, half of the transcript, listen to a little bit of, uh, of Yellen's speech. And it's just, I just honestly, I can't take it any longer. I, maybe maybe I'm, I'm being cynical in my, in my old age of studying Fed politics and Fed speeches and Fed speak and you know, whatnot. You know what? I'm to the point in my life where it's just like, please just tell me what you're going to do. You know, mm -hmm. yeah, we know, but that, I don't know. I don't know. We know what they're going to do. They're going to raise rates. They're going to raise rates in the second or third quarter like we've always projected. Yeah. Okay? They're just honestly, Tim, I think they're just trying to – I think they're trying to keep it at a bare – like like just make it a couple outs. If the markets start to tank, they're not going to raise interest rates if the markets are getting smoked, right? Mm -hmm. They're not, mm -hmm. not going to do that. So – um, this has much, much more to do with the with the equities market and the position in the equities markets than it does the economy. Okay, we know the economy is not doing that well. We know it hasn't recovered, or you wouldn't have had print four point seven trillion dollars in the first place. So this has much more to do with the U.S. equities markets than it does anything else. And that's what a lot of this has to do with, Tim. I, I yeah. swear to God, that's what a lot of this has to do with. Is not the actual economics behind it, but it, but the price of the market behind it. And that's just, I mean, at it's some amazing to me, though, Matt. I mean, they can't let it dip 10 percent. You know, they have to keep pushing and pushing and pummeling. It's like a heroin addict that just is, cannot even come down from their high to take a nap. They just have to, they have to stay that, where they're at the whole time, right in the pocket. You look at the Fed quantitative easing program was announced in and basically starts in early part 2009. They announced an initial $660 billion worth of QE to purchase bonds and whatnot. Mm. Uh, that ends in the summer of 2010, and it wasn't $660 billion, It was $1.7 trillion. Uh, the market goes down about 10% in the summer of 2010. The Fed can't stand that, so they basically announced QE2 for $660 billion more. That lasts until June of 2011. 
Well, it comes out, the market starts going down 18%. The Fed announces Operation Twist, the dollar swap and quantitative easing infinity drives the market up to the all-time highs that we're currently dealing with today. And every time in the last year that the market started going down at all, you had those little clown shoes that Yellen or Bernanke would send out there to give a speech and it would either be uh, the guy from Minnesota, I can I forget his name off the top of my head, it's a weird name, or William, you know, Dudley from New York, or, or something along those lines would come out and say, oh, no, 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 if it ever gets too bad, guys, not your back. It wouldn't be as subtle as that. It wouldn't be as straightforward as that, but that was basically the message was, if it starts going down again, we got your back. We're always going to have your back. So every time it started going down, nobody would rush to stop because they knew the Fed would step in. So it, it's, it, it's 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 really getting a job. Let's bring our guest in here. I mean, my word, you got his, you got him interested. Let's bring our guest in here. Yeah. So we, we've got a special guest, guest here today for the Trading Justice podcast. It's Solon Stefano. Did I say that right, Solon? Stefano. Yeah, close enough. Stefano. Okay. Good. And, you know, you get... You've got some really interesting perspective in here uh, because you're actually from Greece. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, my mom's from Greece. My dad's from Cyprus. So I get both sides of uh, both sides of the equation. So you're, you're from Greece, which is burning in hell right now. And you're from Cyprus that has a run on banks twice in the last two yep. years. I like it. It's worse when your money's actually there. I like it a lot. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. I, I loved your comment in the chat, though. Uh, uh, Salon says, Matt can't talk Fed without dropping an ugly reference. No, I can't. It's, it's impossible. I can't stand that guy. He drives me crazy. He runs in New York Fed. And I swear to God, Salon, you, you, you can agree or disagree, but I swear to God that the New York Fed is driving uh, certain high frequency trading systems into just buying positions in the S&P 500. I, I know that. I, I can't prove it. But I'll, I'll, I would not be I would not be shocked in any capacity if two three years come come now that you'll start hearing about how the New York Fed did something with Citadel in Chicago or some some along those lines. Uh, it drives me a little crazy. So yes, I do not like William Dudley. I do not like the, the New York Fed, and but quite frankly, I don't like any bankers. So, Solon, got a couple questions for you, if you don't mind. You ready? Sure. Yep. Yeah. Before we get into, you know, the whole Greece scenario and before we get into kind of the history of it and, and your take on what's happening over there in Greece and uh, kind of, uh, you know, a, a, an open discussion on, you know, what Greece can, can do to fix some of their economic problems, because I know you have some great suggestions on that. I want to talk really quickly, though, just to kind of explain kind of your journey here, because you're, you're actually a fairly new trader, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Started... Um I actually signed up on Halloween of last year. That's that was the date of the three day workshop. Yeah, is it, and right there out of New York is about three months now. Um, I know that because I was I was the uh, speaker at the uh, training, and uh, so I'm, I gotta I gotta be honest, I haven't seen it, it happens, but I have, I can't recall another student diving into this so much full force, um, where just in three months from now. Uh, three months from from the beginning of your training, uh, what type of trading are you primarily focusing on right now? Well, uh, right now, I just finished my second class, cash flow options, uh, not yesterday, Monday, last Monday, and I uh, started uh, Spread Trader last week. I have it with Micah Brooks every Thursday, so I'm going into uh, my second class. And I also started uh, Forex Trading Labs. Uh, couple of weeks ago with uh, Jeff Crystal. Which, yeah, uh, so in, in three bottom. months. Oh, you're gonna you're gonna enjoy Jeff. You're gonna enjoy Jeff a lot. In fact, Salon, I just got off the uh, off a, um, a discussion with Jeff about an hour and a half it took, and uh, we were going over his fat tools uh, stuff. I was getting it configured for uh, my personal trading and whatnot, and we we're just kind of this new upgrade. And uh, he's got probably right now he's got about seven uh, auto trading systems on Fat Tools with new ones coming down the pike, 
And I know uh, back about a year ago when he, when we were getting ready to release Fat Tools, uh, he basically only had two. He had basically, there was one called Black Bourbon and another one that was called Betty. And now he's got uh, Jameson and he's got uh, one that's called uh, Politics, um, which basically, uh, in Jeff's estimation, uh, one of the central banks ruined a great carry trade um, on the Australian dollar yen pair, I believe it was. And so he, he, Jeff built this workaround auto system to keep on making that carry trade going on. And it just, it uh, for me, just listening to Jeff, it was just absolutely amazing because it goes back to something I've always said for a very, 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 very long time. Whatever politicians think they can regulate, whatever central bankers think they can regulate, uh, traders who understand programming and algorithms and whatnot, they will always be two, three, four steps ahead of them. And uh, so I, you're going to start uh, learning bad tools and you're going to start utilizing it. And uh, you've been trading currencies, correct? Yeah, a little bit. What primarily do you uh, trade in currencies? Okay, so uh, I mostly do the news-based trades just because of the simplicity of it, especially if you can get the ones with the solid numbers in it, like uh, let's say an unemployment uh, uh, statistic or something like that. It's kind of harder to trade um, uh, bank governor mm -hmm. speaking. So I've been doing mostly news-based trades. Also um, at night, I just throw on a couple of charts the U.S. dollar, Japanese yen, and the Australian dollar, uh, uh, U.S. dollar. And if I see a break support or break resistance, I'll just jump in, mm -hmm. uh, small lot size really, uh, nothing that would hurt me, uh, just so I can get the practice in and the training really. And uh, I'll put a, a go to bed trade with a pretty tight stop, mm -hmm. let's say a 10 pip, 15 pip stop this way. Um, and I'll trail my stops too, just so I can make sure Hey, at the very least, I uh, make a little bit of a profit, and it doesn't hurt me. Just I just want to get the training in and the practice, because obviously, the faster you, uh, the more trades you make, and the faster you start trading, the faster you're going to get proficient at it. So my my concept is uh, fail faster. I mean, not necessarily that I'm looking to fail, but hey, if I'm going to make mistakes, make them you know, quicker and can, learn. Think about and this move for forward. a second. Solon's now been in, in the system for about three months. Uh, he's already getting out there. He's, he's mm -hmm. in his third class now. He's in a trading lab on Forex. Uh, he's already starting to talk about, yeah, I trade news-based trades. And I, I, I like the, I, what I love what he just said right there. He says, I love the simplicity of the news-based trade. It literally is one of the most complicated trades out, out there from, from, a, from an understanding perspective. But when it actually, the placement of the trade is actually quite simple, you know. It's well, and also the planning, Matt. That's an important thing. I, I think that uh, what Solon is talking about here is is very important for our listeners to grab onto, because you don't have to do everything. I mean, you know, in my own playbook, I over, have over fifty strategies, mm -hmm. but a new trader just needs to start somewhere. Maybe one, maybe two. I usually say around four to six. It could be forex, it could be options, it could be stock. What I'm loving about what Solon said there is that. Uh, Hey, I'm moving forward. I'm picking up ideas. I'm I'm networking with mentors and traders, and I'm 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 applying my strategies. Too many people get involved with new new businesses, whether it's trading or something else, and they simply don't take action. The only way you're going to learn is if you get in there and pull the trigger. I Tim, I agree with you 100. percent It goes back to something I was I I finally got an opportunity to listen to your podcast with uh, George on Anton. And uh, just listened to it last night and I was kind of, you know, we got done uh, teaching online and I was getting up around and I was cleaning up the house a little bit. So I put on the headset and I was listening to your uh, your podcast and I mean, uh, absolutely fantastic uh, job in the interview with George Anton, by the way. Um, but uh, George says, uh, you guys were both talking about, you know, success and what it takes to be successful and you were talking about how back in the day when you would just, just force the issue and you were telling a story about how, and I remember that meeting, it was back in uh, 08 or 09, I can't remember the year because uh, we had a few of them, but um, we were in Salt Lake City and, and Robert Kiyosaki comes out and basically you go up there and sit right at the table, right, right, with, Joe, right with Robert Kiyosaki and you're just peppering him with questions and yeah. you know you don't take no for an answer and you know you finally get a chance to talk to Robert and get some of the mindset and whatnot 
And George, uh, you asked George a question. You said, George, um, when you first got your job, how'd you get it? He's like, I forced it. I went there and I, I forced the action. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people today, they will not do that. Uh, they're shy. They're complacent. They think it's out of order. They don't think it's politically correct or whatever the case might be. And the thing you got to realize about successful people is they don't care about any of that. Mm. They literally do not right. care about any Well, And there's a difference between being rude and being confident. Right. I mean, I think a lot of people, they worry about politics. They worry about uh, the way they're going to look at the end of the day. At some point, you have to stick your nose in and say, I want this. I want to have this conversation. I want to learn this. I want to network with you. I want you to be my mentor. I want uh, to ask you this question, whatever it is. I want to raise. I have a friend. I think I told this story on the podcast, Matt. I have a friend who he it's, it's Booth. You know him. Uh, he got a he got a raise. He got a new position. He got more responsibility at work, but they didn't give him a van. Okay, he works as an electrician. Van, yeah. So he didn't get a company van. And I asked him, well, why didn't you get a company van? He just didn't give me one. And I I questioned him further. I'm like, well, why didn't you ask for one? He says, I don't know, man. I don't want to bother my boss. I'm like, no, call him. <laughs> I'll call him for you if you want me to. <laughs> <laughs> like, like if, if if you have the title, right. get the job, get the van, right? You know, people just let things happen without Here, stepping up. I don't understand it. You you know, you said that uh, you know. You, well, let me just phrase it like this: anybody who has ever reached out for you for help, have you ever been like, no, no? You know, have you ever been like, no, I'm not going to answer your email. I'm not going to take your phone call. I'm not. I'm not going to do that. No, no. If people, there's more than anything, we want to help. We want to see people grow and become successful. The only time, like you said, if somebody's going to call me up and say, Matt, you're an (laughs) asshole, I'm going to say, okay, (laughs) don't ask me for my help. You know, but if 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 you go up to somebody who is who has found the success and been there and done that, and because the one thing that we all know is that how many people did we have to help us when we were doing? You know, how many people stepped out and helped us? And that's another thing George Anton said, is that uh, part of part of being successful, mm-hmm. you want to give back. And once you start giving back, that's when you really start seeing seeing the success start to appreciate and whatnot. And that's the one thing Solon has done that uh, I wish more students would do, it is when he gets in the Google group and he just starts asking questions and he starts a- answering questions. Or at, the, at tackle trading, he, he makes questions and he, and he takes action. And it's not about, it's just about plugging in and doing everything you need to do to be successful. And and so on, honestly, I just want to say what I've seen you do in the last three months is exactly what it takes to be successful. Now it takes more than three months, as you well know, yeah. uh, but you're, you're doing everything you need to do to be successful. And I applaud you for it. Thanks. Um, I mean, honestly, to tell you the truth, I'm actually... I consider myself to be a student of uh, success and success philosophy. Mm-hmm. So uh, I remember one of the things I really liked best about your three-day workshop is you went into the magic of, uh, not, not the magic of thinking big, but thinking grow rich by Napoleon Hill. You went mm-hmm. into the richest man in Babylon, uh, George S. Clayson. Those are two of my favorite books. And I do, I love to spend time reading, uh, reading about success philosophies, uh, watching interviews of successful people and uh, what they attribute their success to. And something that uh, you guys kind of went back and forth on it, uh, what it reminded me of was an interview that Steve Jobs uh, gave. And there's like a little uh, minute, minute and a half uh, snippet on YouTube. You could probably find it. And uh, the interview basically was um, when Steve Jobs was in junior high, uh, when he was a kid, he actually picked up the phone book, called uh, Bill Hewlett, uh, from Hewlett Packard, and uh, asked him for some spare parts on a frequency counter. I mean, I don't know what a frequency counter is, but he had the uh, not the audacity, but that uh, that kind of pull, that kind of urge to uh, to just just go for it. Just call Bill Hewlett up, and Bill Hewlett just picked up the phone book. I mean, picked up the phone, laughed, and gave him a job uh, assembling frequency counters at his uh, at the shop. And uh, that's how Steve Jobs kind of got into uh, the whole computer thing. And that's the kind of mentality I try to embrace, really. If you see something, 
take advantage of it. And don't take advantage of it in a negative way, but just uh, make all you can out of it. Because opportunities are few and far in between. But uh, once you get one, just don't let it go. Attack it. And uh, I kind of saw the same opportunity in that three-day workshop to kind of make something, uh, make something more out of my finances, make something more out of uh, my future. Because honestly, the reason why I do attack it so hard is I don't want to work a nine to five for the rest of my life. I kind of want to be, I want to have that financial peace of mind. I want to be financial independent. I want to have the security that you do have from being a trader, from uh, taking control of your money and your finances. So, I mean, that's just the mentality I have though. And what I love best about Robert Kiyosaki's philosophy is that, uh, you know, the 98%, they value security, a false sense of security. While the top 2%, they value freedom, freedom of choice, freedom of uh, uh, financial freedom, freedom to do whatever you want, any time of the day, or whatever. So I kind of well, here, here's the, the whole, reality, uh, though. I, I got to cut in here for a second, Solon, because here's the reality. Whether you're dead broke out there or whether you have all the money in the world, you have that freedom if you just make that choice right now. I hear people talk to me all the time about how they want to leave their job. They want to get away from it. And I understand when, when you're under financial pressure, it's like I got, I got to pay the bills. I got to pay my rent. I got to pay. No, freedom is a choice. You, you just step out and you make your life different. Anybody out there can do that tomorrow. Now, that mindset is hard to make that transition into immediately, but freedom really is a simple choice. I'm just not going to let anybody, I'm going to try to build teams. I'm going to try to build networks. I'm going to improve my consciousness. I'm going to get better at life. I'm going to do it tomorrow. I'm going to wake up and be awesome. That's something I say all the time. I'm going to wake up and be awesome. And, uh, but a lot of people get stuck in their, in the rut. And I, it's hard to pull out of it, I understand. But really, it's not money people need to make the choice. It's mindset. It's the ability to say, okay, I'm going to start using my time differently. Instead of streaming 12 episodes of Netflix, I'm going to build a business. Instead of, you know, laying on my couch or whatever, you know, watching Sports Center, I'm going to actually watch an old video from Tackle Trading and learn more about Forex. You know, it really is just a, it's an ambition that you have to kind of embrace. I know you've embraced it. I've seen it. And uh, I think that you've got a bright f future in front of you. But I, I want let's I want talk. you to think about this, though. Let's, let's ahead, talk, guys, because we all know that that um, it, it comes down to choice is what it comes down to. It comes down mm -hmm. to choice between uh, what people, how people want to participate. And you can either be like in like in just kind of referencing back to that podcast with uh, George Anton. You can either make a choice to be an employee. You can make a choice to be the entrepreneur. You can make a choice to be the financer. But you got to make a choice. What most people, what most people make the choice to become is an employee because that's all they know. They never, they never reach outside the things that um, that. Outside their fear zone, for example. So, what would you? Uh, and I want to ask Sol on this, and then Tim, and then I'll answer. So, what would you say is the top three reasons why typical, average, normal American consumers will never ever get the control of their financial lives like they want? Why? Why do you think people are just stuck in the? Okay. Right um. State? Top three. It's kind of tough to just limit to three, but. Uh, if I could give one of them, it's fear. Uh, a lot of people, they live day to day in a state of fear. They're afraid of what could happen instead of being, um, instead of anticipating uh, what could happen. So uh, there's the fear of it, uh, of it all. There's laziness. I mean, there's just sheer laziness because it's so much easier to just go home and uh, after work and watch your favorite uh Watch your favorite TV shows. Watch your, uh, uh, I don't know, whatever's on 8 o'clock at night on Channel 7 or whatever. Because people would just rather sit on the couch and kind of waste away instead of actually, uh, yeah, check out. And instead of actually just uh, taking a class, reading a book, or doing any of those things. So there is that aspect of laziness. Um, uh, I mean, a lot of people wouldn't wake up early before going to work to kind of just put in that kind of work and then kind of, cause you put the work in now, but it's, it's just planting a seed. Uh, I consider it just planting a seed. I'm planting the seed now that's going to blossom a year from now. 
it's kind of like um, I was listening to a motivational talk the other day, and um, <clears throat> the title of the talk was The Chinese Bamboo Tree. And the whole metaphor behind it is that you plant the seed for the Chinese bamboo tree, and you plant it in the ground, and essentially for four, uh, about four years, the Chinese bamboo tree does not sprout at all. I mean, it's just, you just plant it in the ground, you have to water it regularly, because it does need to be watered regularly, and you have to take care of it. But it, nothing comes out, you don't see any fruit, any results. And then after, for about four years, in a span of four to six weeks, it's going to shoot up 80, 90 feet. And the moral of the story is, mm. when is the Chinese bamboo tree growing? When does it grow? And the whole thing is, it doesn't grow in those four to six weeks when it shoots up 80 feet. It's been growing for the whole four years that you didn't see results. Mm. So you have to plant that seed. You have to consistently and persistently water it. And eventually, you're going to get the, the stalk. You're going to get the fruit. So there's that, and people just don't see it. They don't see. They don't understand the concept of delayed gratification. I'm going to give up something now so I can have a lot more in the future. Mm -hmm. And the third and final thing, and I think it's the number one thing, uh, possibly, is people just don't have confidence. They don't have confidence in themselves, and they don't have confidence in others. And uh, I think they actually do have more confidence in others than they do have in themselves, which could be the most, the biggest problem because. Mm -hmm. You know, I share that I study, I study the markets. I'm interested in investing. And you know what a lot of people, and I tell them, guess what? You can do it too. It's so simple. You can just follow this and you're gonna, it's going to start seeping into your subconscious. You're going to start understanding it over time. And it's not that complicated. But uh, their first uh, instinct is, well, you could do it, but I can't. And that's, that's, a, whole, that's, that's a huge problem. Uh, people just underestimate themselves. They don't have the confidence. They don't have the self-belief. And uh, it kind of goes back, and I actually met this gentleman, uh, to Dr. Uh, Shad Helmstetter. He's actually uh, a phenomenal psychologist, but uh, he wrote the book, um, What to Say When You're Talking to Yourself, uh, When You Speak to Yourself. Uh, it's all about self-talk. And, and a lot of people are programmed throughout their lives, throughout their childhood, into their adulthood, with negative self-talk, uh, the average person has heard no almost 200,000 times by the time they hit 18, and that's in a reasonably positive household. I mean, that's just, it's phenomenal, and a lot of people are raised with negative self-talk, and that's why when they become adults, they're kind of limited um, in their ambition. They're limited in their, um, I guess, a certain type of capacity of what they can envision uh, themselves to be. So I think that's that's probably the biggest killer, that people do have such bad self-talk, they have such uh, low perception of themselves. Mm -hmm. I personally, I'm fully confident that, guess what, if uh, a Matt Justice can do it, I can do it too. And I'm completely confident that I can learn mm -hmm. from somebody else. I, I'm totally confident that if Tim Justice is willing to uh, to Skype with me and teach me a lesson, I can pick it up, I can write, take notes, and I can just do it over and over and over again until I learn how to succeed. And actually, Shad Homesteader uh, does talk about that, that if you had to write a book, uh, uh, if you had to write a book on uh, success, uh, the entire book would just be repetition, repetition, repetition. And that would just be it, because if you repeat something over and over again, you're going to get good at it. And I truly believe that. And uh, it's kind of why I, I interact so heavily. It's because I just want the repetition. I just want the... If you have to repeat something to me a hundred times, I don't care. Just keep on saying it until it gets into my head. And then eventually it will get into my head and I will execute it. So that's just my mentality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I really like that. And I agree with every one of those. Tim... It, it just pick up where Salon kind of left off there. What would you attribute people's lack of ability to to get out of the rat race, lack of ability to see something better? What would you attribute that to? Oh, I've been teaching for a long time, and I'm thinking about all the people I know and the perspectives that, and also the, the experiences I've had getting to know where people are. And, and most of these people want to make changes. And many of them do, but not every one of them. 
I, I think the first thing, Matt, is that a lot of people surround themselves with the wrong people. It's like the old thing your, your mom and dad will tell you, you know, uh, we can't let you hang around with the wrong group of friends. If, if all you want to do is hang out with your buddies from college that have no ambition, you, you're not going to get ahead, you know? Well, yeah. you know, Tim, I was, in a, I was in a training just last week and I was down in the L.A. area and uh, somebody uh, uh, somebody it pipes up and they're like, you know, Matt, I'm just, I'm just, I have so many people in my life that just want to pull me down and mm-hmm. just, they don't want me to succeed. And I said, yeah, they're called family, <laughs> you know, I was kind of joking to a certain extent, but we surround ourselves with the people we grew up with. And most people don't expand outside that, that dynamic, you know, they don't understand how big of a world there is out there and how many people really do want to help them out and help them succeed if they just you know, put it out there. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, surrounding yourself with the proper team and, and having the courage necessary to expand outside your, your local demographic that you grew up with, I think, I think is, is very important. Yeah. You have to expand your team and you have to expand it with people and they don't all have to be experts, by the way. I, 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 I always get the, uh, the thing from a trader. Well, I don't have anybody who trades in my neighborhood or in my family or in my life. And I just think to myself, and I even tell them, people, a lot of people this, you don't need a trader to help you grow. Maybe you bring somebody in who's just organized that can review your, your progress and your goals that will give you honest feedback. You know, uh, Are you willing to, to communicate with somebody? It doesn't necessarily have to be an expert at something, right? Maybe somebody that you can just trust that you're willing to grow and communicate with, that that can also help you as well. So I think building the right team. I, and, I, and that's one of the reasons why we did this whole thing with trading justice. And we're, we're always looking to expand our team with people like Solon, quite frankly. Um, a lot of my best colleagues were once students, Matt. No, I, I, I agree 100% with that. But we hear that a lot from people. Oh, I, I, I don't know anybody that's, tra- that's trading. What do you mean? You're talking to us. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. been trading for ten years. Mm-hmm. What are you talking about? You can all you have to do is just throw a dart out there in 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 the proper area. You'll find some traders. Now you're not going to find those traders that are in your local demographic. You're never going to find those traders in your family, and that's just not how it works. But but that's why we have a rich community over there at Tackle Trading. That's why we started the Trading Justice podcast is to is to give people a, a, another avenue. What would be your what would be your third reason why people cannot find success? Well, I don't know if I got through two. I, I got through probably ten already. But I will say this, I, and this is big for me, and it takes me back to what I was talking to to George about a little bit, and also back to one of the podcasts I did on my own where I talked about Bar- Mark Benioff's um, journey. Um, I I really think. Part of it is that we are trained as human beings to think vertically. And what I mean by that is that somebody is above our station, somebody is above our our expertise, and they get to tell us what to do. We have bosses, we have government, we have police, we have all of that. And, And at the end of the day, what the reality is, is that every one of us, there's the old saying, we all put our pants on the same way, right? Um, you're a human being. You have every opportunity that any other human being has. Mm-hmm. And I know that some people start in life with more money or less money and all that kind of stuff, but that doesn't matter. It doesn't mean anything. You can wake up and do what you want to do with your time. Well, guys, you're already losing it. Your number one investment is the U.S. dollar. It's a devalued asset class. Your number two investment for consumer America is your checking and your savings accounts. And those are devalued asset accounts courses and classes as well because uh, you lose money based on devaluation and inflation. And so everybody in America is an investor. Mm -hmm. There's just people who know how to do it properly and people who uh, allow other people to make money off their hard hard work. Right, right. You know, uh, I love this conversation. In fact, uh, we may have to do like two podcasts with so long. <laughs> because I, I think we're first talking about the journey and the mindset, but we also have a lot of actual news to talk about. Uh, with well, Greece, Greece has as definitely well. been in the headlines recently. And what I mean by recently, so on, I mean the last four years. Um, but uh, just recently, it's came back into the headlines. And uh, we, it, one of the reasons why we wanted to bring Salon on is because not only is he from Greece, but he understands kind of what's happening over there. He understands kind of what the, what's going on in the Eurozone 
and to uh, shed some light on on kind of that Greek situation because it's uh, it's very much up in the air right now, Salon, regarding whether or not Greece eventually leaves the EU or whether or not they continue to uh, to uh, work with the EU or whatever the case might be. So I want you to kind of uh, just openly talk about um, you know what is going well. Let's be frank. What is going on with Greece? What what's the problems associated with this? Why do we keep hearing about Greece uh, in the headlines? Okay. Um, well, with Greece, it's uh, pretty much a one-liner. Greece is in debt. Uh, they're in a lot of debt. And uh, depending on what numbers you look at, uh, we're currently seeing Greece has uh, a nominal debt of about uh, in excess of 300 billion uh, euro, not dollars, euro. And that's kind of jaw-dropping, especially when you consider that their economy is estimated to be at around 240 million, uh, sorry, 240 billion uh, dollars to around 250 billion dollars. And uh, that's considered to be a pretty unsustainable, uh, unsustainable debt load. Now, what happened was there, obviously, it wasn't always like that. Uh, in 2007, 2005 to 2007, they were okay. Their debt was sustainable. But once that last market uh, crash came about in 2008, everything just kind of went downhill and they were running massive deficits. Uh, at its peak, they were running uh, a 12% deficit. And that's kind of unheard of uh, in what's considered a first world country, uh, a, an EU country running a 12% deficit and the EU uh, dictates that you have to run at most a 3% deficit. So for a few years, they were running uh, massive deficits. They were what you would call cooking the books. They weren't uh, putting out the right, the right information, the right numbers. They were kind of hiding uh, how big their debt levels were up until 2010. And uh, around 2010, you kind of saw George Papandreou and that government uh, the the Paso government at that time, um, you know, just unveil everything. They just uncork the the monster that is the Greek debt crisis, and uh, they, the whole European Union had to take dramatic action to to sustain it. And the way that they decided to go about it is through uh, harsh and uh, severe austerity. And you know, in hindsight. Now, explain to, real quick, Solon, explain to the listeners out there what austerity is. All right, is. so austerity, if we're going to bring it down to a microeconomic uh, point of view so that a lot of people can relate, it's essentially you're living beyond your means for a long time, you're racking up the debt, and then all of a sudden you get to a point where you just kind of notice, hey, my finances aren't looking too good, I need to cut back. I need to cut back spending. So with uh, the way the Germans... Uh, uh, put the austerity plan, to, uh, not just the Germans, but the whole uh, EU put the austerity plan together. It's Greece had to make cutbacks on a lot of things that they were spending on. Uh, cutbacks as far as government jobs, they had to uh, lay off a lot of government employees, they had to cut a lot of programs, they had to, uh, uh, now one of the major things that they have to do is pension reform, which uh, is one of the obviously key issues that they have to address uh, as they go forward. And, uh, you know, it kind of, you saw the Greek economy spiral out of control a little bit after 2008, but once you uh, uh, added the austerity aspect to, uh, to the recession that they, hit, uh, that they saw, it just turned it into a full-blown uh, depression. You just saw that economy contract to, at that point, it was estimated to be at around $300 billion. It contracted all the way down to $240 billion. It, they lost about 20 to 25 percent of their GDP. Unemployment soared to uh, as high as 27 percent. And that number has been coming down over the past uh, two years, a little bit. But uh, you just saw they had a problem, and the austerity measures Honestly, I kind of agree that they did need to tighten their belts, but the dramatic introduction. Well, I, yeah. I was going yeah, to ask you that in your estimation, because the when we look at some of the responses from this this recession, depression, however you want to categorize it, over the last six years, uh, most of the responses from a na national perspective hasn't been about cutting back. It's about how do we put more money into the system? How do we 
how does government spend more money? I mean, that's what Keynesian is. And then out of Greece, you have the, the austerity about cutting back and whatnot. And in your estimation from an economics perspective, uh, do you agree, do you disagree with what uh, the EU and specifically Germany uh, put on uh, put on Greece with the cutbacks? Well, I agree that they need an austerity. Um, I don't think that can be questioned, really. Their, their government spending was a little out of control. It was really out of control. Uh, statistics, I was in Greece in 2011, and uh, one of the things I saw on one of the news channels was that about 50% of the workforce was employed by the government. It was government jobs, which mm -hmm. is a little ridiculous to think uh, a capitalist nation has that much of a dependency on government jobs and on government sustaining the economy. And uh, it kind of goes back even further because in the 70s, Greece was a fascist state. It was a dictatorship. And it wasn't until uh, the early 80s uh, that it became a democracy. And the way that they modeled themselves was kind of, of uh, some weird hybrid of a socialist slash capitalist democracy. And it just didn't work well. I mean, there uh, there's so many issues within the Greek uh, economy as far as collective bargaining. The labor unions are just way too strong. Uh, there's a lot of government-owned assets, uh, things that should be private, kind of like energy, uh, the energy sector, the utility sector. Uh, the government had their hands in nearly every major sector, including telecommunications and whatnot, and they never really privatized those and uh, for a long time and it put their economy back and it's just the, the mentality there mm -hmm. it, it got carried into the present uh, where the you know the social talk was when somebody's growing up here we say uh, go to school get good grades graduate from college go get a great job over there uh, the, the talk is go to school graduate from university go work for the government because that you're going to be taken care of you work for 20, 25 years, you get a pension for the rest of your life. Uh, the average retirement age, just to drop one number, was uh, 57, 58. And uh, that's kind of dangerous. Uh, you can't sustain. And Matt, I know you go into it a lot in uh, your three-day workshop about the whole pension program and how that failed mm -hmm. and how we have the new mutual funds and uh, 401ks that are failing as well. Yeah. Try having a whole government centered uh, pension program that's going to take care of people for life. That's what so, you're seeing now. Honestly, so everything you're saying right now just kind of makes me just think about it. I mean, back in the 70s, 60s, 70s and whatnot, uh, you were living in a very different type of political environment in Greece than you, than you were in the 80s, 90s and, and into the 2000s as well. And I, can just, I just can't help but think that coming from a socialist regime in, in, in a certain capacity, it is so difficult to have a, an easy transition into more of a democratic capitalistic uh, economic system. You're always gonna have those old remnants of social policy, social mindset, uh, because it, it not only starts at the government level, it's, it's in the consumer level as well. So even despite the, the shift from, a, from an economic perspective, you still have that mindset from, hey, let, listen, let's go to school, but you know now let's just go work for the government, let's have a pension. And uh, those those numbers can never maintain stability because uh, I'm, I'm sure the Greek population is very similar to every other population that you're going to have people that are living older and older and older and you will not be able to take care of them. It's going to it's going to you're going to take people out of the workforce who are not producers and you're going to replace them with people who are now in government aid. And that's going to get to the point where you're simply do cannot make enough money to maintain your spending habits. And. And you know what, so on, Greece, when you talk about the Greek debt situation, 300 billion against 200 billion in terms of uh, GDP, that's not that big a difference from what the Americans run. Yeah. The Americans run about a one-to-one -one debt, to, debt to GDP ratio. And in fact, if you look at some of the other industrial nations like um, uh, Japan, for example, Japan runs a much higher one-to-one yeah, yeah. -one, uh, GDP to debt ratio. Uh, so that's not that bad, but there's a thing that Greece can't do that some of those other industrialized nations can. The uh, the uh, uh, Japanese and the Americans, and even into the ECB now, they can print as much money as they want to offset that debt. Well, that's something Greece can't specifically do for themselves because they're part of 
a, a currency system that is not a singular currency system, but is part of a uh, dynamic where you have multiple countries in that currency system. So it, it's, you know, when you talk about from a, you know, Greece is this bad, I mean, from a number standpoint, yeah, they are. But they're, they're no different than any other country in the world right now. It's just a matter of what they the limitations they have in terms of uh, their spending. Well, and also, terms. Matt, I want to cut in here for a second and say socialist plus capitalist. That was one phrase Solon used that grabbed me. Solon, you may not know this about Matt and I, but we actually studied politics as our formal education, political scientist. And uh, that's what I went to school for back in the day, and I loved it. Um, you know, socialism and capitalism, is that not what we're seeing in, in the States as well, Matt, to kind of go along with what you're talking about? Well, you know, honestly, you look at you look at social policies and whatnot, 50% of the American people are on some type of government yeah. aid right now. I mean, 50% are on some degree of government aid, not working for the government and so on, but receiving benefits from, from government in the form of some type of uh, financial aid program, uh, workforce services, food services, you know, these, these types of government programs, you are starting to see that uh, over here as well. And I think that leads to something you said earlier tonight. It's one of the reasons why Americans today are, are high, somewhat complacent because wages have not increased in America since 1989, but the right cost of living has increased in America by about at least 60% over the course of the last 25 years, if not if, if not even more than that. And so now people in the States, when they don't have a job, they actually make more money while they're on unemployment than they did at their job. And so it, 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 it's it's not just, and that's why I want to make sure that we're, we're clear here. When when I say negative things about Greece, and, and Solon has heard me say negative things about Greece, it's not just a Greek problem. That's the thing I want everybody to be clear of. The, the things that, that Greece ran into problems with, it was not a singular scenario to Greece. I mean, you look just look at the European Union for a second. Uh, wait till Italy gets in the, in the, in the in their spot in the uh, uh, showtime. What, wait, what about wait. Spain and Portugal? Did you see that article that came out today that, uh, about France? I, I haven't right. seen it yet. No, uh, New that? York Times released an article. France gets more time to meet EU budget rules. So they have up until 2017 to... Uh, to balance their budget, it already shifted. The talk already shifted. Uh, it, it's it's because it's there. Everybody knows that uh, it's when we talk about Greece from an EU perspective, it is not just about Greece. It is it, it, Greece represents something that is a macro major problem, not solely in Greece, but in other economies out there as well. Greece is just kind of the first one they're picking on until uh, it, so that they can kind of work out the blueprint to deal with Italy and France. Yeah, I mean, I kind of, uh, I've been kind of following that narrative for the past couple of months with the whole uh, change in government and uh, Syriza's rise to power and um, how it's, how the whole media kind of blew up the whole Greek situation. And to tell you the truth, I feel like that whole, uh, the whole Greece being in the media was more for Italy and France's benefit than it was actually about Greece. I 100% I agree with that. Now, uh, very quickly before we get back into this topic, I do want you to explain one thing because it is kind of, uh, it, it's a little confusing with the, kind of the po political situation. Can you explain to all of the listeners, uh, because what has Greece had? Three elections without having a, having an elected official in the last year? Uh, they've had okay. multiple uh, regime changes in the last three years. How, how does the political system work over there? All right, it's um, it's a parliamentary system, so it's really you vote by party, and you don't really vote for your uh, officials per se. You just vote for the party, and they split up the seats in parliament, and uh, it's taken from there. Now, uh, a couple of years ago, a few years back, uh, the first Greek government to take on this whole. Uh, crisis in 2010 was PASOK, which is the, uh, the left-leaning party. Uh, and then after that, it's New Democracy. And that's the party that's been in place since about, I believe, 2012 up until uh, recently, up until last month. And now you have, for the first time in the past uh, 30 years, 35 years, a third party come into power. And uh, that's, that's been a game changer, really. 
Uh, this third is party. That, is that the latest one? Just barely that uh, made headlines getting the election. They're a little more on the radical, yeah. radical end of the uh, philosophy. Yeah, it's uh, Syriza, which uh, uh, is, is the far left uh, party. And uh, for the past, since 2012, they've been in the news. They've been uh, rhetoricians, basically. They've been very vocal about uh, raising wages, uh, putting more government jobs, uh, getting creating more government jobs for people, giving free um, free electricity or free energy to people who need it, uh, free food for people who need it. Which obviously, uh, considering that Greece is going through a bit of a humanitarian crisis, is kind of uh, needed because there there are a lot of people who have been out of a job for a long time, and a lot of people who are struggling with their finances but they've been uh, they've been pulling the public public here for the past couple of years and essentially with uh, the cuts getting deeper and deeper and deeper the public just had enough uh, I mentioned earlier that it was up to 27 percent unemployment uh, for the entire country but for the Millennials uh, my generation and even going into your generation unemployment's at 50 percent. Uh, you know, for people in their 20s and early 30s. It's rough out there. I don't know how I feel about Salon saying for your generation. That made me feel really old. <laughs> well, you're, yeah. <laughs> your generation X, I'm generation Y. I know, I know. A little I'm bit of a... Totally kidding, totally kidding. It's Matt, just, I, do think, I do think I saw a bald spot on you the other day. No, no, I talked to a guy that was bald. He, he was at my training this past week, and he said... <laughs> Uh, he says, uh, "No, Matt, you're 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 probably good. If you weren't bald by now, you're going to keep what you got." <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was always nervous about that growing up because a lot of our uncles, uh, mom's brothers, were bald, and they say that's where genetically it comes from. So I always figured I was going to lose my hair, but I didn't. No, no, you got flowing locks. There's no doubt about that. But coming back to the Greece situation very quickly, it sounds to me, and again, I'm not an expert on on Greek political scenarios and. Greek debt and whatnot, uh, but but I, I do understand it to a certain extent. Um, it does sound to me like the party. And what is the party's name again, Salon? It's uh, Syriza. S Y R I Z A. Yeah. Yes, and it's an acronym. They don't have a majority of uh, parliament seats, do they? Uh, no, but very close, yeah, very close, because they won about thirty nine percent, and they were gifted some extra seats. Yeah, I, it was very close, but they it, but it was a it was a raving raging victory for. Uh, that party, though, I mean, they they absolutely dominated that Greek election last uh, last uh, um, month. But at the same time, it sounds to me, to a certain extent, from a historical perspective, um, that I've seen many, many times that uh, when things get at their ugliest, a lot of times people go to radical solutions, and, and it seems like uh, that the Serzha party is bringing back some of the old old mindset from a socialist perspective. Correct me if I'm wrong. No, um, and here's the thing, because the whole Facebook post that I posted a couple of, uh, about a week and a half ago, uh, where I responded to a friend's, um, a friend of mine posted, I was a political science major in college as well, and philosophy double, and uh, he also uh, was a political science uh, major in grad. So he posted something on my Facebook wall uh, in regards to the Greek government, and he asked me for my opinion, and uh, it wasn't going to be short. And uh, it was a, it was the title of the article was "Democracy versus Austerity," mm -hmm. and there was a tone to it of uh, Greece becoming a little more radical. And I opened up that article. I mean, my response was, you know what? I see a lot of parallels to a previous situation. And I don't want to use it like lightly, but it kind of reminded me a little bit of what uh, Germany went through mm -hmm. post World War One, post uh, Treaty of Versailles, when they had so much debt, they were printing money, uh, inflation went out of control, and they were in massive, huge depression. And you had a socialist party, coincidentally, in the Nazi party that kind of rose to power in a parliamentary system, and they had the same kind of. Uh, the same kind of a margin the, that Syriza did. They had like 35 to 40 percent, uh, the Nazi party did at that time. And they, they were just back through a lot of rhetoric, a lot of promises to the people of how things are going to change for Germany. And it's kind of like the same, there's some parallels with it now. You have this similar economic climate, massive depression, 
you have uh, people are just desperate for something new, something different, and they're willing to do whatever it takes to get out of the situation that they're currently in. I agree with that. And and very quickly, and then I'll let Tim chime in. Uh, mm -hmm. We're nervous about saying Hitler or Nazis or whatnot. And, right. But the reality is there is some commonalities there. There absolutely is. And there, there's a lot of it's it's when we talk about kind of, you know, the, the Weimar government that took over in the 19, 1919, um, that had nothing to do with the Nazi party at that time. Um, it actually happened wow. outside the Weimar government. The Weimar government ran up until about 1923. Uh, the, at the Versailles Treaty, we put, I believe it was $32 billion in debt uh, mm -hmm. burden on Germany. Um, coincidentally, they just barely paid off that debt. They're now working on World War II debt. Um, but, uh, you know, it was it was basically through their monetary policies of printing money and running large deficits that basically led to hyperinflation in the, in the German mark in 1923, and they killed the German mark. And in 1923, uh, when they killed the German mark, that's when Hitler wrote Mein Kampf. And, you know, it took, it took another seven years before Hitler came to power in, in some capacities. But when you have radical situations like that, historical radical situations where you're talking about hyperinflation or death of currency, it typically does go to a radical element. That's that's what typical populists do, is they, they go to the radical mindset, the radical mentality. And that's kind of what I felt coming into what, what Greece did just recently, is I don't want to say they take a, they took a step back, um, but I don't I do not see and, and Solon, I'm again not an expert on this, but I, I just don't see how how going to the, the the policies of the past is going to help Greece migrate into the future. Hmm. Well, yeah, I don't know if you want to jump in, Tim. Well, you know, I'm thinking I, I was willing to to let this go wherever it, it may, but I do want to kind of talk about this for a second because I think whenever somebody uses references from history that they don't believe can happen again. Uh, they have to step back and think about this. In a crowd, human beings are willing to do things that they wouldn't do individually. Mm -hmm. Okay, And so when people are pressured and they're also in a group, so when you said 50% of people in their 20s don't have a job, that number jumped out at me. I didn't know that, Solon, in Greece. I mean, so you have this entire populace that is is under pressure under the gun they're living a different existence than probably a lot of people out there listening to the podcast and i just think about these these examples from history and i'm just recognizing that there's you know there's risk here that probably uh we're not even hitting on yet mm -hmm. well yeah, when 50 percent of the uh, of a certain demographic especially a young demographic doesn't have a job they're they're going to go to the streets and they're going to make change that history has proven that, mm -hmm. you know, and so it's, it's, I, I, I knew that the uh, unemployment situation was really nasty over there, um, but I did not know that it was that high, that, that, that is a very, very high number for uh, people that are, you know, planning on going into the workforce and becoming Phil, a Phil, check that for, statistic. Um, <laughs> we need Phil to be our stat checker. I, I, I oh, that's mean, awesome. Not, here in the U.S., here in the U.S., we have 11% unemployment for people that re just graduated col uh, college. The number is higher if you take into account the entire demographic. And mm -hmm. for people that are just graduated college, there's a, like a 58% underemployed level here in the U.S. And so that's like 68, 69% of all recent college graduates, not including the people that don't go to college, okay, all recent college graduates that don't have, can't find full-time employment. I mean, that's here in the U.S. I absolutely 100% uh, b believe that number, it might even be slightly higher than that. So, Salon, what would you say? I mean, it, we're looking at two different things here. You have austerity, which is basically cut all spending, get back to the bare bones from an economic perspective, and that's created a, a certain depression uh, from austerity. All right. Then you have the Shiraz uh, party that wants to bring back more social spending and whatnot. Which, which out of those two cases, which one do you think is most best suited to get Greece back into a good economic environment? Uh, it's a combination of the two. You, have, you can't just uh, you can't just be either pro austerity and pro social spending. You have to take. Um, I'm I'm a little uh, closer to austerity 
than I am to bring back all the social spending because it was excess. Uh, they they were just running too high deficits, and um, looks like Phil confirmed the 50.6 unemployment rate. There you uh, go, for millennials. Yeah. So you, you like need it. you need a combination of the two. And uh, one of the people I'm really fascinated with, and I know I uh, shared a link, uh, a couple of links with this guy, is the new Greek finance minister, Yanis uh, Varoufakis. And uh, he's an extremely, extremely uh, interesting person. Uh, one of the EU officials uh, off the books called uh, referenced to, to him as a, a communist with a Burberry scarf. And he just, <laughs> he just bucks the trend. And Cyprus also bucks the trend a bit because he refuses to wear a, a necktie, which was kind of funny because when uh, Alexis Tsipras, the new prime minister, uh, met with Matteo Renzi, of uh, the prime minister of Italy, who's also a bit of a younger prime minister, um, uh, Tsipras is 40 years old, uh, Renzi is also from uh, the younger generation. So uh, 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 Matteo Renzi just gifted him a necktie, a necktie to kind of wear because he never shows up to anything with a tie. Um, Varoufakis is also the buck the trend. I'm going to show up in a button down, uh, shirt open, uh, blazer over it instead of a suit and tie. So uh, they're kind of, and I feel like it is kind of significant in a way because they're going to show, or at least I believe they're trying to show the EU, hey, we're not going to play by your rules. And the article that I shared with you guys was uh, on game theory. Uh, Varoufakis is a professor of economics, and he's actually a student of game theory. And he actually uh, co-wrote, co-authored a book on game theory, an introduction to game theory back in the 90s. Uh, so, I mean, just to get a concept of what game theory is, it's uh, the strategic, uh, uh, essentially it's the mathematical study of decision making, of conflict uh, and strategy in through social situations. That's game theory in a nutshell. And uh, he's mm -hmm. look, he looks at different uh, situations, different strategies through a different viewpoint than the rest. So when you see these guys, they come in and they're not dressed the same as everybody else. They're not speaking the same as everybody else. He wants to, uh, they're essentially setting a precedent that you're not going to handle us the way you've handled our predecessors. You're not going to, uh, you're not just gonna lay down the law and uh, we're just gonna abide by it. We're gonna want some concessions, which in the past week, they've kind of pulled back a little bit or a lot of it. So uh, they've uh, nearly took uh, all the concessions off the table for the near future, but they just wanted to come from an extreme. The first move that Cyprus did when he, uh, came into office is he went to a, a socialist memorial that was erected uh, after the Nazi invasion of at a site where Nazis just gunned down uh, socialists, Greek socialists. And that was kind of, that was kind of big that his first, uh, the first place that he visited right after being elected was at a socialist memorial against the Nazis. And the first thing that the foreign minister said was uh, essentially, I think the European Union's too harsh on, uh, too hard on Russia, and tried to kind of create like a little detente before even opening up communications with the EU. They already started talking about uh, sanctions on Russia and that they're too harsh. Mm -hmm. So their negotiation tactics, they came from an extreme, and I think they came from, uh, they just wanted to be very strong negotiators with the European Union to show that they're just not going to roll over like they're, like the previous uh, Greek regimes have. No, uh, that's interesting that that's the first response that they had politically to the EU was uh, a disagreement, not on the debt restructuring or the or the bailouts or the payments or anything like that, but on a, a basically an off off quote on uh, Russia and the EU sanctions because there is a lot of disagreement between the EU regarding Russia and the response that. Uh, the sanctions uh, that happened on Russia. Yeah, yeah, and uh, it's it's been fun tracking their progression through the uh, through the European Union because first they met with uh, prime ministers and financial ministers of Italy and then France, and with them they've had a a bit of a warm union basically, 
two other countries that are fiscally, I don't want to say irresponsible, but uh, they have to get their fiscal houses in order. They can relate to Greece. They're considered more southern nations, uh, Italy and France, and uh, you have a common culture there. And they were welcomed in Italy and France very warmly. And as you go into uh, Central Europe, as you go into Germany, as you go into Belgium, you know, it's been a lot harsher. Uh, the interactions between Varfakis and uh, Schobel uh, have been, it's almost like night and day when you compare the two. And uh, they couldn't agree on anything. And Schobel's not pulling punches. He came out oh, yeah. full force the last month. Um, I do. I, I want to ask you a couple of questions very quickly. Um, it seems like the new party, the new regime's kind of philosophy is take a hard, hardline stance between, between the debt restructuring, but that makes me kind of think that there might be somewhat underneath that a desire to leave the EU, because if you're going to take a very hard structure with the EU regarding debt restructuring, if there's not an agreement on that, they're going to leave it the EU, either through their own choice or getting kicked out uh, because of Germany. So what percentage of the Greek population, I guess my question is this, what percentage of the Greek population would cherish or agree with um, leaving the EU? Um, not much, to tell you the truth. Because uh, I've seen the same, uh, same kind of ideas out there that Greece may want to leave the EU. That Greece may be better off if they just uh, uh, leave the EU, redeploy uh, a new currency, the new drachma, and have their own monetary policy. And I've seen a lot of articles that uh, this, all of these tactics may just be ploys to kind of uh, say, you know, the European Union forced our hands, now we have to leave. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just don't think it's there because before. Uh, before they even started negotiating with the European Union, when Tsipras came uh, came up for his concession, I mean, not concession, but uh, when he accepted the role of prime minister, he reiterated over and over and over again, we are not leaving the EU. Leaving the EU is not an option. And in, in his interviews going into being associated with uh, Syriza, uh, Varoufakis also said, hey, Leaving the EU is not the answer. That's not that's not going to lead to the nation that uh, we can become. It's going to have to be through structural reforms, and uh, that's they've taken a hardline stance that we're not looking to leave the EU under any circumstances. We just want to reform some of the policies. We just want to cut, and it looks like the only concession that they're going to get potentially out of this um, bank extension that they agreed to is that they don't have to hold as big of a surplus um, in regards to as big as big of a surplus uh, this year and going forward because the EU wants Greece to hold a 3% surplus this year, budget primary budget surplus, 3% uh, surplus before interest payments get factored in and uh, payments to the E uh, to their creditors get factored in and it's going to uh, go up to a 4.5% surplus every Every year following 2016. Now, uh, that that's actually, the, I think, the main sticking point that uh, Syriza, Tsipras, and Varoufakis really wanted is we want to cut that down by 1.5%. We want to run a 1.5% surplus this year and a 3% surplus going forward. This way, we have more money to uh, take care of the needs that we need, I uh, mean, that we need to take care of. We need to take care of the people. We need to uh, give back to the people, which honestly, it goes back to Julius Caesar's uh, concept of bread and circuses. If you can keep the people fed and if you can keep them entertained enough, you essentially have a very passive uh, and pacified populace. And as a ruling party, that's what they're looking to do. So uh, Caesar's, Caesar's thing in 2015 would be um, McDonald's and Netflix, right? Bread and circuses. <laughs> You put a burger, yeah. you put a burger in everybody's hand and give them a, a, a show to watch. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Pretty much. To tell you the truth, McDonald's is so much tastier you know, in, so in Greece. <laughs> hey, Solon, I think we got to do a round two for this to continue the discussions on the EU and, and Germany and, and Greece specifically. Um, so let's 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 schedule a round two, uh, Phil, for this. Uh, maybe a few weeks from now to kind of continue these discussions and 
there's going to be a lot of uh, updates over the next few weeks that we can kind of go on as well. Uh, you know, one thing I'd like to do, Matt, with that is maybe get Solon back on after the March 5th event, which is that ECB report uh, where they're talking about their asset purchasing program. Uh, talk about the news-based trade, how it affects what's going on with Greece. Uh, that that might be a good time to, to do round two. I think that would be absolutely fantastic. But I've enjoyed the conversation so far. I think this is a great, great time to kind of just put a little under wrap and then we'll start again in in round two of this. Does that sound good for you, Solon? Oh, that sounds phenomenal. Awesome. I'll tell you, I'll tell you right now, I've thoroughly enjoyed the conversation. Um, Just kind of making sure everybody understands what's going on over there and what's going on in Greece and whatnot, because there, there's probably been more headlines on, on a 240 to $300 billion economy than I've ever seen in my lifetime over the course of the last two months. (laughs) Um, and it's it's a fascinating discussion, um, and uh, Greece has such a historical importance uh, to it. And I just my hope is from from where I'm sitting is that uh, cooler heads prevail, okay, between uh, between Germany and Greece and the EU, and we find a way to get this uh, we find a way to get this uh, agreement done where you know Germany can be satisfied in the restructuring of the debt and Greece can pay their bills. Yeah, I agree. You know, you guys have been listening to the Trading Justice podcast with Matt and Tim on our special guest, Solon. Solon, it's been great to have you here. Why don't you send everybody out there uh, just a message and let's let's close this thing out. Uh, there's nothing more than just take, uh, take advantage of all the resources that are out there for you. Take advantage of the Tackle Trading website. I know that I've been uh, hitting up the Tackle Trading website at least twice a day, mm-hmm. in the morning and at night. And uh, that's progressed my financial education. So just keep pounding it, keep trading, keep doing whatever it takes to make sure awesome. that you secure awesome. your financial Awesome. Do you have a Twitter, fo- do you have a Twitter uh, feed you can uh, give out to the people that want to follow? Yeah, uh, I believe it's at Solon Stefanu. So it's S-O-L-O-N-S-T-E-P-H-A-N-O-U. Awesome. And uh, uh, producer Phil, put that in the uh, recap uh, as you do so people can follow uh, Solon as well. Solon, thank you so much for joining the Trading Justice Podcast. And uh, we'll uh, we'll look forward to round two for this, okay? All right, you've been listening to the Trading Justice Podcast, and we are out. Later. You've been listening to the Trading Justice Podcast. If you've enjoyed yourself and think that the conversations and topics we've covered are important, help spread the word. Give us your feedback. Five stars on iTunes, like us on Facebook, and follow us on Twitter. The Trading Justice Podcast is proudly sponsored by TackleTrading.com. Get off the sidelines and get in the game.